Can you hear me, Sophia? All right. Okay, we're going to try to get back on the uh, on the on time train here. Here we go. Before we jump up to a new level, which is going to take us out of the CFLs into this area and talk about one of the great contributions of the last century, really, in, in computer science and in math, uh, I want to do a little quick review of what we've done so far and uh, remind you of the big picture. So we're talking about computation and how easy and hard it is to recognize certain kinds of sets of strings. And that's a very simple form of computation. Somebody describes to you a set of strings, some of which are in your, the, a collection of which you're supposed to accept, and we come up with different machines that are supposed to be able to do this job, and then we program those machines. So a very simple kind of machine like that is a finite state machine, and here we can pretty much characterize and describe exactly the kind of languages or sets of strings that finite state machines can do. And just, just to, for a benchmark, we'll put an example here. Uh, 0 plus 1 star 101, 0 plus 1 star. That's one way to describe a finite state machine. There it is. Uh, that's a regular expression. Anything followed by 101 followed by anything. These are all the strings that have the substring 101 in them. You can make a machine for it. You can make a grammar for it. There's an example of the simple kind of things you can do down here. There's a lot fancier stuff you can do with finite state machines, but they all reduce to something that looks like a regular expression. And now we're going to jump up, and we add on some more power. We give the machine a stack, and we insist that it stays deterministic. And what's an example of a language that's not in finite state machines, but is out here in DCFL land? Who knows? Who can give me a good example? Good. Zero to the n, one to the n. 0 to the n, 1 to the n can't be done by a finite state machine intuitively because there would have to be a loop in it, in the 0 part, that would pump it up and give you strings that aren't of the form 0 to the n, 1 to the n. But something with a stack can accept this and doesn't have that issue with the loop. And you can do this deterministically without having to make any choices. If you move up to the next stage, you're allowing non-determinism in this finite state machine with a stack, and that actually gives you more power. There's a distinction whether you have determinism or non-determinism at this level. There's no distinction here. Non-determinism here is the same. What's an example of something that requires a non-determinism as far as you know? Can you think of any example? W. Well, WW isn't even in here. Uh, I'm sorry. You mean? Yeah. I mean the complement of WW. I'll put that here. I think that's an example, the complement of WW. Things that are not of the form where the first half is the same as the second half, you can do this with a non-deterministic machine, but there's no way to really do it with a deterministic machine. I've never proved that to you, but there is a way to prove it. It's hard to prove, and it's definitely there. The complement of this, WW, is actually not even in this area. It's back out here in the, in the higher levels of complexity. What's another example of a CFL which is not a DCFL? There's one very famous example, and you should keep this kind of in your mind as, as kind of the, a paradigm of an example of something that pushes you up a level. It's the union the union of two DCFLs that are very simple. Each one of these is a DCFL that's simple. If you union them together, there's no way to do that without non-determinism. And there's a proof that there's no way to do it without non-determinism. So this is what we've been talking about, different kinds of languages. But the really interesting languages are further out than here. In the CFL and DCFL, we have some interesting languages, the languages that describe programming uh, tools. And those are important because that's what compilers are based on. And most of those are in here, in the DCFL world. And the kind of grammars associated with this are special kinds of context-free grammars called LRK grammars. But now we're going to move out to fancier sets, sets that, that we might not be able to, uh, to recognize at all with any kind of computation, and sets that require a really more powerful computation model than just a push-down machine that's non-deterministic. 
So, moving out here, I'll put some things in decidable. And here, it's everything. There's a lot of examples of this. So one is WW. Another is 0 to the n, 1 to the n, 0 to the n. Neither one of these are context-free languages. This one intuitively because if you only have one stack, you can keep track of the first set of zeros by pushing them, match them with the second set of ones, but then you've lost your count for the third set. This actually is included in two-way push-down machines that are deterministic. So if I put those in, they would kind of stretch out, including all the DCFLs, and stretch out and capture that little language. But there are non-deterministic push-down machines that accept languages that deterministic two-way ones don't accept. So the picture would look kind of like this. I'm not going to do it because I like this nice bullseye, and if I start putting in other classes that don't end up being concentric, it'll get a little ugly. But there are plenty of other classes you can do by adding certain features and taking away certain features that have these things overlap. One very important feature is that when we get out here to the Turing machine level that we're going to talk about today, to the level that's essentially equivalent to you guys writing programs and being able to, to either accept something or not accept something, when you get to this level, almost every variation of a Turing machine is as powerful as a Turing machine. Non-determinism stays right in there. Uh, extra stacks stay in there. Uh, any, other, any features you want to add to a Turing machine, don't ever give it any more power. It's a very robust model. Let it go two-way, it already goes two-way. Allow it to stay in one place and not move in either direction, no extra power. Whatever you add to it, it's just a convenience. All right, so these are both languages that Turing machines can accept. The way to convince yourself of that, even before you know what a Turing machine is, in your head intuitively, you should always think that if you can do it with a program that you can write in Lisp or Java or any language that you're comfortable with, then you can do it with a Turing machine. Right? But in principle, actually doing that may be a little difficult because a Turing machine is like, it's like, let's say I teach you to do arithmetic. Right? It's third grade again. And you learn this method, and you add them together, and you carry, and you... I'll probably make a mistake here. Right? There's a procedure here, right? I could write, I could write it down. Maybe elementary schools do it. You know, they tell you what to do step by step. And maybe these kids follow it, and they learn to do addition. And then you teach multiplication. You know, so that's... That's kind of built on addition. So 8 times 2 is 6, and carry the 1. And, and then you do some addition later, and it's... Here, look. I hate to just do addition, but what the hell? Uh, did I make a mistake? There's a reason I'm doing this. All right. And now I can teach you how to take square roots. I bet you all don't know how to do square roots. Maybe you do. Who cares? You can hit the button on the calculator, right? But these are computations. This is what we think of as a computation. You could write a program that does this. You could write a program that reads these things in as arrays and actually simulates these operations. You could do it. A Turing machine has very little flexibility in how you're going to describe to do this, even though it can do everything your programs do. It's like I put one hand behind your back. I don't give you a blackboard anymore. I give you just this space in the blackboard. And you've got to write everything in a single line. And then you need the instructions. And the instructions say, go to the end of the second number. So I go down my line, like I got one little I. Hmm, eight. Okay, now go back past the plus sign until you see the end of the other number. Oh, there's a two. Now add those two together and see what the result is. And put a special sign here, equals, and put the result over here. And then remember that one in a finite state somewhere and go all the way back here and look at the second number here. Oh, so maybe you should like mark this off with a special symbol, like an X, so you remember that you passed it already. And mark this off with a special symbol. And now go back and do the same thing. 7 and 5 is 12. Add the one that you had in your finite state somewhere, and you're going to get uh, 13. But now push that 0 down so it's out of the way. And put your 13 here. Your three there, and then remember you had the one, and now cross these two out, go back. 
Well, if you hit a plus sign here, that means there's no more symbols there. So go all the way here. There's a three here. You can add in your one from your carry final, from your carry uh, finite state. Three plus one is four. Shift these down again. And you're done. I'm doing this because what Alan Turing was thinking of when he wanted to strip away the notion of computation is he said, do we really need the blackboard? Do we really need to be able to write in two dimensions? What do we really need to do computation? And he stripped it away to what he thought was the barest minimum. And if you read the introduction to his original 1936 paper, it starts just like that. He goes, what do you really need? It's just the convenience to write in two dimensions. It's just the convenience to have lots and lots of symbols. We could just have two symbols and encode everything in zeros and ones. Think of how much worse that description would have been if they were all zeros and ones. Every something that I did, every addition would have you know, 10 or 12 instructions. So it's like your simplest two-line programs in Java become 400-line programs for a Turing machine. Not quite that bad, but that's the spirit. It is not fun to write programs for a Turing machine. It's important to do it only to the point where you've convinced yourself that it really has as much power and as much generality as these more convenient models. So that's kind of an intuitive introduction to what a Turing machine is going to be. It's going to be a model of computation that's equivalent to any of your programming languages, but with everything stripped away down to its bare minimum. And even then, it's technically a little difficult to make mathematical arguments about computation. Even then, some of the proofs are a little tricky. So without that, there's no way at all. People for thousands of years had a notion of computation. Euclid in 300 BC describes the greatest common divisor algorithm. And it's very algorithmic. It's very step-by-step -step how to get it. But nobody really captured the essence of what we think is a computation versus what we think is just logical human thinking until the last century. And that was carefully formalized by Alan Turing and at the same time by Alonzo Church. Church and Turing. They did it independently. Turing came up with what we call a Turing machine, which is a little bit like this funny method of computation I just described. And Church came up with a lambda calculus, which is very, very closely related to uh, the language scheme that you spent a month uh, programming it. You probably did a few weird theoretical lambda calculus extra credit kind of problems. I imagine John Pizarro would have done that. It's kind of his style. Uh, anyway, you can describe any computation with the lambda calculus. You can describe any computation with a Turing machine. How can I prove that? Well, it's kind of no way to prove it, because what is computation? What these things really are are definitions of computation. The 20th century has come. We want to formally def define what we mean by a computation. And a computation is no more nor less than something a Turing machine can do. So there is a sometimes called, a, I don't know, a, a Church-Turing thesis or hypothesis or, or, um, or, or assumption. It's nothing you can prove, so it's not a theorem. And it basically says that what we normally think of as a computation, what we normally would all agree upon as humans, that this is a computation, is exactly what you can do with a Turing machine. No more, no less. Now, I should point out that this is a mild point of contention. There are some people who feel that maybe there are some computations that we can do as humans that are not modeled by a Turing machine. But that's more discussion for Patrick Winston to talk about if he gets into that area in AI. There are some nice books by Roger Penrose, who's a physicist, who talks about quantum mechanics and the idea of what you can really do with a machine. And maybe there are things, organic things, can do that are more powerful than any machine because of quantum mechanics at the basis of our structure, and there is no quantum mechanics at the basis of these, uh, of these Turing machines. And it's a big subject. It's complicated. It's mostly philosophy, and we're not going to get into it at all. We're going to believe the Church-Turing thesis that what we think of as computation is perfectly reasonable to be thought of as what a Turing machine does. And I tried to give you some sense of Alan Turing's discussion as to why. He describes addition, and he says, look, you can do addition on a long tape. It's just a pain in the butt. Okay, that's basically the idea. All right, so we filled in our diagram. Now we're in decidable land, w, w, 0 to the n, 1 to the n, 0 to the n. These are things that weren't context-free. Now they are acceptable by a Turing machine because you could write a program to do it. Here's something that's more complicated that you can write a Turing machine for. Uh, how about things 
Uh, strings W, X, here, pound sign X, pound sign Y. W, X, and Y are binary strings. And accept any strings like this where if you add W to X, you get Y. Okay, so in other words, accept things that show you understand addition. Turing machines can also do output. I mean, I can have the Turing machine take W and X and spit Y out. It could also do that. But we like to keep things in the accepting uh, world rather in the recognition world rather than in the uh, computation output world. We didn't do any output with finite state machines except in how computers work, or we didn't do output with context-free languages except in parsing. The output comes in applications, but from the theoretical point of view, you can always think of computation as yes or no, do I accept or not accept. So this is the, st the string to show you understand how to do addition computations. Wx, where the sum of them equals y. How do you write a Turing machine to do that? It's a little like the Turing machine I was writing here, a little bit. In fact, of all the, I am going to give you a few Turing machine programs to write on your own, because you should get used to it. You should get a feel for it. And of all the ones I ask you to write, this is by far the most complicated. You're going to have a big, big page with some long English description of how it's working. And it, it's going to be quite involved. Today, I hope we'll get to some examples that are a little simpler. We'll do this one, for example, today on the board. And this will be a little complicated. Basically, uh, I'll call them odd numbers. Recognizing odd numbers in binary. You could actually do that with a finite state machine. Odd uh, numbers are numbers with ones at the end. So that really all the way in here. But you could write a Turing machine to do it too. And then the very last problem, which is much harder, it's not here, 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 it's really out here, is prime numbers. Go ahead and describe to me a method writing numbers down in binary in a single line to go back and forth and somehow figure out whether it's prime. Step by step instructions. This is so tedious that the problem says, think about how tedious it would be to write a Turing machine to recognize all prime numbers. And that's all you have to do. <laughs> but you do have to write this one. You do have to do enough of them so that you get a sense of how to do it. This is, you'll even find a nice paragraph in Mike Sipser's book about this. About, about, he discusses you know, how much programming you should do with Turing machines. And he basically says what I'm going to say now in a nutshell, and, and everybody believes this. Do you have to be able to write Turing machine programs? Well, you've got to be able to know that you could do it if you had to. And as soon as you're good enough, then you don't have to do it anymore. So, you know, you can just say I'm good enough, even though you're not, but... <laughs> You're just fooling yourself. So do a few until you feel you really get the idea, and you could do it, and you feel it's nothing but tedium, and it's not any new idea. And at that point, you stop. And I think when you get to this one, everybody will be there. You put it on your resume? <laughs> oh, yeah, that'll help you get a job. So, well, I've programmed many Turing machines. <laughs> oh, come right out here, please. There's our Turing machine department. Just please close the door on your way out. <laughs> yeah, well... Where are we? Okay. This is all meant to be intro. Other questions so far? I'm kind of moving on to this slowly because I really want you to get the big picture. There's some very deep, interesting results and some very mechanical things as well. But I, I don't want you to lose the big picture before we move in. Questions? Yeah, Todd. Uh, code versus data. Does it, can a Turing machine modify its code? Is there a concept of code or is it just reading its transition table? Uh, I haven't really told you what a Turing machine is yet. But it can't look at its own code. It can take input that represents it can take input that represents itself. So in that sense it can look at its own code. But it can't if you don't give it itself as input, then it can't look at itself. Um, the same way your program couldn't, I suppose. I mean you can send your program into itself as data and it can compile itself. A Turing machine can do that. So you can represent a Turing machine as a binary string and send it to other Turing machines to check things about it. Like, um, like you can check if a Turing machine you know, has three states or not. You can check if a Turing machine um, accepts a particular string, except when you try to check that, you might run forever. All right, so decidable things are sets that you can make Turing machine programs for or write programs for. And 
They always stop and say yes or no. They never mess up. Those are decidable things. You've seen a lot of these problems. Undecidable problems, you'll notice there's another level. Not even partially decidable. Undecidable problems are sometimes called partially decidable. You can kind of answer them. What's an example of a problem that's undecidable or, or what we call partially decidable? A problem that you can kind of say yes when the answer is yes, but if the answer is no, you'll never figure out that the answer is no. What's a good example of that? Uh, post correspondence problem, halting problem, those are all examples. Let's do post correspondence problem as a particular example. That's where you're given those pairs of strings and you're asked, is there a sequence that's going to make the two uh, concatenations equal? If there is a sequence that makes the two concatenations equal, you can write a program to find it. It will eventually find it and say yes. That problem, the strings of pairs of strings that satisfy the post condition, that set is partially decidable. Because you can answer yes when the answer is yes, but you'll never know when the answer is no. All right? You can recognize that set. You'll get the answer when, the, when you should get the answer. It's complement. The pairs of all strings that don't have a sequence that make the two concatenations equal. The things that are not post-satisfiable. That's not even partially decidable. You'll never find out when something's not going to get those sequences. You might run forever. Problems and their complements come in pairs. Usually one is undecidable, and the other is not even partially decidable. Okay? We'll talk about this again. There's a lot of terminology, so I want to give you the terminology. In our book, decidable is called Turing acceptable. He likes that term. Decidable and Turing acceptable are the same, and there's a much more standard term that mathematicians used, which, which, which filtered into computer science, but computer science had another meaning for this term. So it really annoys computer science students, and I think Mike Sipser correctly got, got it out of his book and left it as a footnote. But com mathematicians call this set, Dimitri knows, right? Recursive. Recursive, yeah. Recursive. I won't even write it clearly, just in case you'll write it down and get it confused. No, it's fine. These are called recursive sets. They do have something to do with recursion. They do, but but they're likely to make you think the wrong thing. From now on, when I say a recursive set, I mean no more and no less than it's decidable. No more or no less than there is a Turing machine which looks at a string and says yes or no every single time, one or the other. That's what a recursive set is. Out here, there's another terminology. Partially decidable, undecidable, those are the same. Turing recognizable, I can recognize when the string is in my language, but if it's not in my language, I might not recognize that. I might run forever. These programs are not real programs. They will loop forever, possibly, if the answer is no. They will only give you the answer correctly when the answer is yes. So we don't really like problems that are out here very much because they're hard. But they're better than problems that you can't even recognize. Okay, so there's a little bit of a distinction in these two uh, levels. But they're both bad. They're both too, too hard to do. The equivalent to recursive in this level is called recursively enumerable. Recursively enumerable. Recursive or sometimes RE, short for recursively enumerable. It's just another term for the same idea. Anything out here that is not partially decidable is called not recursively enumerable. The set of all Pairs of strings that do not have a post-correspondence solution are not recursively enumerable. There is no way you can take one of those inputs and guarantee to say yes when the answer is there's no, uh, there's no sequence. You'll never do it. Okay. Part of what we're going to be doing in the next week is talking about Turing machines, talking about what they really are, doing some real examples, talking about how you come up with problems that are undecidable. How do you come up with the first one? Once you come up with the first one, you can do reductions to other ones. And we did some of those reductions for context-free languages. You come up with very practical problems that nobody knows how to do. And it's an interesting result.
That's Alan Turing calling. <laughs> you are completely misrepresenting my idea. He says in his English. Oh, jeez. <laughs> 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 I, I was thinking of... <laughs> Alan Turing was really a German spy, <laughs> and that's why the British spy. Uh, what a bad imitation. I can't do a British accent. I can only do German. <laughs> Best of the blushing test. Here, get that on camera. Uh, so what did he have to say? <laughs> uh, <laughs> Sorry, I'll go back to my grave now. <laughs> All right. Uh, inside here, inside the decidable ring, is a whole, whole big area of, of science called complexity theory. And it gets divided into numerous concentric circles and overlapping circles dealing with how much time it takes to decide things and how much space it takes to decide things. When Mike Sipser gave his colloquium, he showed a very nice picture of this ring expanded out into all its different uh, commonly talked about classes. But if you, if you go you know, do some research, you'll find complicated diagrams describing the whole hierarchy from here to here. That's what we'll do maybe the last couple days of the class. If we get a chance, we will go inside here and blow it up. Inside here is the P versus NP uh, question. Inside here are time hierarchies and space hierarchies of how much it takes to actually do a problem, not just whether you can do it or not. But right now we're at a much higher level. You know, it's like that would take a zoom in, but now we're way zoomed out and thinking just whether you can do things or not and just these very, very basic distinctions in computability and in computation models rather than the time it takes for a particular Turing machine or for Turing machines in general to do things. We're not talking about that yet. We'll do it later. Yeah. I don't know. Why not just you know do it as you know, hierarchy, you know, like layers above each other, and you could write horizontally. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, maybe I should do that. I don't know because I think because because this is inside this, right? This is a think of this as just one big world. So the world of of the world of decidable things includes the finite state machine. Well, then I can hear it. Yeah, well, I do, I guess. <laughs> I don't know. This is, this is the way it, I've been doing it. Maybe there's a nicer way. I don't know. I don't have a good answer. Uh, all right, so questions about the church touring thesis, questions about this diagram, the big picture, where we're going, anything? Questions? So a Turing machine, more or less, is a finite state machine, except it's got, well, it doesn't have finite states. It's got kind of infinite states. But it's not really just an infinite state machine. It's not just the same thing and say, well, now you can use as many states as you want. Because how would you write such a thing? Right? You'd say dot, dot, dot. It doesn't make any sense. So you don't just say, okay, well, now I'm allowed an infinite number of states, even though intuitively that's kind of what you're doing. What you do is you say you still have a finite number of states, but I'm letting you manipulate a very long tape that goes on forever. Every spot on this tape holds a single symbol of your alphabet. If your alphabet's binary, then they hold zeros and ones. The finite state machine sits over here and controls this tape. This tape is your only data structure. Depending on what state you're in and depending on what symbol is on the tape, you can write a new symbol there and move to the right or left. Okay, so you have two-way motion on this tape. You can write on the tape, and you can move to the right or left after you're done writing on the tape, and that, and then you can move to a different state, remembering that now you're going to do something else. Jeff, you have a question? Or? Okay, okay. Is that instead of the stack, or there's the stack? Also? There's no stack, but certainly you can make a stack here, right, by just moving over here, putting a symbol, and and think of it like RAM, right? I mean, if you have RAM, where's your stack? You know, it sits someplace at, the, at this area where nobody's going to ever, like, bother it when, when they ask for new memory, and then it just grows upwards in memory. 
So you could have a stack that grows you know, out this way, and then if you ever get to it, and you're going to overflow into it, just shift it all down one. Right? So I mean, you, you, you can make stacks. You can make lots of stacks on this tape. So is this memory, is this addressable? No. No. But it's effectively addressable. You could actually number the cells. You get, I, I'm going to, yeah, it, it's a really good question. That, that Michael's asking, you know, can you say I want to go to cell number 52 and just go there? You can't. All you can do is look at a cell, see what state you're in, and move left or right. But I could write little Turing machine procedures that fill this tape with little numbers and little empty spots for data and write a little Turing machine procedure that takes a number like 52 and moves along the tape looking for that number 52 and stops the head right at the beginning of the data space after 52. So I can simulate, uh, I can simulate RAM with a single tape. It's not what you'd want to do normally, but you can do it conceptually. So anything you can think of as far as storing information, you could do with this Turing machine. Actually doing it is another story. How do you count? Just with a finite state? You count by using the tape. If you counted with a finite state, there would be a limit to how much you could count. But if you want to count, you can just start writing one and start adding one. Make a little binary adder and shifting it over and carrying the one, and if it's a one and one, go to a zero, and... So I can write a little addition between in finite state machines. Sure. You can definitely write an addition algorithm in a finite state machine. You can describe it to me yourself. Basically, you know... Here. Let's do an add one, right? Go to the end of the string. If it's zero, just change it to a one, and you're done. If it's one, change it to a zero, and move left. And then do a loop. So that description is a finite description, and it uses this infinite tape to let you do it on numbers as big as you want, and that's a counter. And you can surround your counter with special symbols on your tape, you know, like a sequence of six ones at one end and a sequence of six ones at the other end or something. You know, and, and you look for those sequence of six ones to know that my counter is here, and that's where I'm going to go. Usually we use special symbols like a pound sign on either side. The alphabet of your Turing machine can be as big as you want, zeros, ones, special symbols, you know, A's and B's, whatever you want to put in, just like a finite state machine. All right. So that's all a Turing machine can do. It's very simple, bare bones, but it's enough to do everything. It's enough to do anything you can write a computer program to do, including object-oriented, hierarchical, blah dee blah You can do it all here. You can do recursion on this. You can do anything. Okay. What does the program look like? Well, we're going to try to keep our same notation for programs, using you know states to be circles and transitions between states to be arrows. And now we have to imagine what's going to be on these arrows or transitions. For a finite state machine, the only thing on the arrows was what? The input was the input symbol. For a pushdown machine, the arrows had an input symbol, the top of the stack, and then something that represented how we manipulated the stack, whether we pushed it or popped it. Here, every arrow is going to have a symbol that we're looking at, followed by a new symbol that we're writing on it, on top of it. It erases the old symbol. Followed by capital R or capital L, saying whether you're moving right or left. So three things on every arrow. OK? We start from the input of the string. I'm going to say yes, but I'm going to get rid of the always, because we'll talk about it. There's different ways of thinking about a Turing machine. But the standard thing is imagine that the input is given to you from the left end to the right, and after it's done, there's nothing but blanks. Capital Bs represent blanks on the tape, and the tape is full of bl filled, filled with blanks. So you can tell when you get to the end of your input when you see a blank. And you can certainly, here's the thing. The reason I said always, yeah, the input is given to you here, but if you want to kind of not lose your input, you could easily copy it over to any other place on the tape. It doesn't take much of a Turing machine program to say, look at this symbol, move over until a blank, copy the symbol there, move back, get the next symbol, copy it, move back, get the next symbol, copy it. I mean, it's a long job to copy a bunch of symbols in a Turing machine instead of just you know, a single memory instruction, but you could certainly copy it anywhere you wanted and never lose it. So once the input's given to you, you could clean off the tape, put it way down there, and use this as your work area. 
How does this differ from a two-way pushdown machine? Where, where does the extra power come from? Being able to go, being able to go left and right and right on the tape anywhere you want is more powerful than the stack. A two-way pushdown machine can go back and forth on the input, but it can only use a data structure that's uh, last and first out. And this lets you use any data structure at all. But Chris is asking a good question. If I allow a two-way machine to have two stacks, then it can actually do everything here. And that's not such a hard proof. Maybe I should finally just explain that. I've been saying it about a dozen times this year, right? Now that you know what a Turing machine is, let's figure out how to do it with only two stacks instead of this big tape. Here's what a Turing machine looks like at some point in its, in its execution. It's looking at the zero, and there's a whole bunch of symbols to the right, and a whole bunch of symbols to the left, and the arbitrarily long to the right, arbitrarily long to the left. Here's the idea of doing it with two stacks. Let's say you want to write a one here and move to the right. So the next picture would look like this. And the head would be here. Okay? Write a one and move to the right. All you have to do is imagine that somebody snipped this infinite tape in half. And this side is one stack. And this side is one stack. And when I go ahead and change and write something and move to the right, I'm pushing onto the left stack. And I'm moving to look at the other stack. And if I go left, I push on the right stack, and I move to look at the left stack. It's just a matter of moving your symbols. An infinite tape is simulatable with two stacks. When you move to the left, pop it off this guy, push it over to this guy. When you move to the right, do the same thing. So two stacks is enough to, to represent any kind of uh, general tape that goes infinitely. That's kind of the idea. Does that make sense? Some of you it does. We need to get into some real examples, I think, to actually do one. As tedious as that can be, it's also, I think, a little illuminating. So, let's do, uh, let's start with this. We're moving our way out of the hierarchy. It's like those science museums. There is the Earth. There is the sun. There is your galaxy. All right, so we're going to move our way out, out to the beautiful nebulas. We're going to do this not the way a finite state machine does it. Well, because it can't do it. <laughs> we're going to do this not the way a pushdown machine does it. We're going to, well, here's my strategy at least. We're going to see these zeros and ones. I'm going to see a zero. If I see a zero, I mark it with an X. And then I move all the way over until I see a one. When I see a 1, I mark that with an X. So I see a 0, I see a 1, I cross them both off. Now I go all the way back until I bump into the X that I made before. And then I turn around. I see another 0. I mark that with an X. I go all the way back. I see the symbol I marked off here. I go past it. I see a 1. I check that off. And I say to myself, doing OK. I go back. I do the third one, the third one, the fourth one, the fourth one. Sooner or later, I got no more zero. So I go all the way to the end here, and I'm hoping to goodness that I get a blank at the end of all the symbols that I checked off instead of a one. Pretty simple strategy. It's going to take us half a board to write this up. Now, how would you do this in a program? Somebody reads in an array, say, of, of, of characters, and you're supposed to tell whether the first half is zeros in the second half ones. How would you do it? Would you do it much differently? How would you do it? Okay, right. So you would use a counter. You would actually start from here and and say, you know, for i equals 1 to, you, you count the length of this whole thing, and then you check whether the first n over 2 of them were, uh, were zeros by some loop that goes through. Now, you could do that on the Turing machine, too, except we'd have to first build a counter. And every time we'd see a zero, we'd have to move over to that area of the tape that has the counter and add one to it and move all the way back. Maybe it's a better strategy than this marking off strategy. Maybe not. But we just thought of this marking off strategy. 
Okay? So there's more general ways to do it. Any way you can think of doing it in a program, I could simulate on the Turing machine. But maybe brute force, your first gut instinct wouldn't be to do that on a Turing machine because it's too much of a mess. All right, let's try to write this. Here's our start state. If we see a zero, what do we put? We'll put an X on it and we'll move to the right. Okay, so I'm Xing off zeros. Now what? You write this machine for me. I got it down here. If you make a mistake, I'll ch fix it. Skip all the zeros that you see. I agree. That's a good idea. Skip all the zeros. How do you skip zeros? If you see a zero, write a zero on top of it. You can leave a symbol the way it was by just writing it over on top of it. So you can move over any symbols you want and then move to the right. Because when we come back, we got to know that we, that we looked at it. We're going to be checking each one of these against each one of the ones. All right? All right, now what? All right. Those of you who are so forward-looking as to notice that we might have to add something else in this loop, good. And we'll come back and do it later when you realize it. Huh? What do we get next? When you find a 1. When you find a 1? Yeah, I'm putting a Y. I want to distinguish it from the other symbol. I'm not sure I need to. But I'm doing it anyway. And then go back left. Now what? All the way back. This is the lowest level of understanding how a Turing machine works. We're actually writing the implementation. We're writing the details down. A little higher level would be what I said at the beginning. A Turing machine to recognize this kind of string, we'll start matching symbols one at a time. Seeing the zero, skip over all the zeros and then match it with a one, mark it with special symbols, go all the way back and do the same thing. If the symbols match up and there's no extra ones and there's no extra blanks at the end, it accepts. That's a second level, a little higher level of abstraction. And then maybe the highest level, and these, these three levels are actually, uh, Mike Sipser talks about them in your text and it's worth reading them. The highest level is, well, here's a scheme program that does this. And a Turing machine can do anything a scheme program does, so I'm done. That's like what Chris said before about the counting level. So he talks about when should you do which level. So at the beginning, do this for a while until you get the sense of what it is. And then move up a level where you start talking about descriptions that are a little higher level but still talk about how the Turing machine would do it. And then when you're convinced Turing machines can really do everything, either you're convinced because you really believe it or just because you want to say that you believe it, then you can start talking about higher level descriptions that, okay, I wrote a scheme program to do it or a Java program to do it. Enough of that. Blah, blah, blah. Let's go on. Go back. How do we go back, Joe? What, what transitions do I need here? You need to uh, count zeros, pull top zeros, or check the top of the stack for a zero. There's no stacks. Uh, the tape for a zero, write a zero, and then move left until you hit an X. But I haven't gotten back yet. Okay, we also have to one skip the X as we have. Is we're in the one. No, the first X you hit is where you stop. No, except the first X you hit is going to be. We, we, we didn't skip over the X's that we put for the ones that we've already got. We got Y's on the ones. We got, we got, when we're going back now, we've got to skip over those Y's. So if I see a Y, just leave it and go back. Okay. Why? Because there's going to be Y's behind me when I turn around, and I've got to go over them. And then what you said is right. We skip, over the, uh, skip over the zeros also. Okay. Right, right. We need to skip over the Y's here. On, no, it's the Y's. We need to skip over the Y's going forward. Why don't we wait until we actually come back forward through the loop to put that in? Everybody's going, ah, what are you talking about? We'll fix that. All right. At this point, where do we go? Go back to the first state. And when we see a, an X, we leave the X, move to the right, and now we're ready to read the next zero. This is a little different than the push down machine. Yeah. Could you like draw, show this on a tape? You mean what it's actually going to do? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Let, let's, let me finish writing and then, and then we'll show the configurations. Is that what you mean? Yeah. What, yeah, yeah. And you think I should do it right now? Um, yeah, maybe. You can make it I'll do it right now. Just let me say one thing. You'll notice here, there's a loop. This is no more or less than the regular for loops in all your programming languages. This is what it's saying. It's saying, go ahead, look for a zero, check it off, and go back and do it again. 
go back and do it again. And we're going to put a little condition in here that tells us when to stop doing the loop, and that'll be a transition out. So, you know, I could spend a whole week trying to convince you that Turing machines can do loops, Turing machines can do if-then-else statements, Turing machines can do arrays, Turing machines can do random access into an array, Turing machines can do stacks and queues, Turing machines can do recursion, Turing machines can do objects. But I kind of want you to internalize that yourselves. It's, it's a lot of work, and it's something that will just, you'll feel after a while. What does it look like after we've gone through this loop once? That's through a few steps of our Turing machine. It looks like x, 0, 0, 1, 1, 1, y, 1, 1, b, b. If I give you this picture, somebody just came in and tripped over the Turing machine's cord. All right? So it turned off. And we want to turn it back on and continue from where we were before. Just like in your computers, when some I.O. device interrupts your program, and then you want to keep going. In architecture, what happens to your program when somebody says stop, and then says, okay, now go on where you were before? What does the machine do? It remembers the program counter. It remembers uh, the values of all the registers. What does it do? It takes a picture of the machine. It says snapshot, click. I'm going to store this over here. And when you're all ready to go back, I'll put everything back in. What does a Turing machine need to store that takes a picture of itself? It's got to name this thing. It's called a configuration. A configuration of a Turing machine is a picture of the state of the Turing machine right now. So if you had it, you could continue from there. Well, this is part of it. The tape is part of it. What else do you need besides the tape? The position of the, of the head and, and what state you're in. Right? That's enough. If you know what state you're in and where you are, what symbol you're looking at, you're okay. So, configurations are often written like this, with the state of where you are, written in between two symbols, with the convention that the state is about to look at the symbol to its right. So in this case, what does it really look like? I'm going to rewrite this and give you a better picture. Where are we right now over here? Where we just read this X, and, we've moved left. and we moved, we moved right. No, we moved right. Oh, it does move right. Okay. Right, it moves right. So we're sitting here, about to look at the zero. So we write, and what state are we in? Let's m number these states: A, B, and C. We're in state A, about to look at a zero, and the rest of the tape looks like this. I'm going to put a big circle around this. That's a configuration. That's a picture of the machine right now. State A, about to read a zero, and that's what the tape looks like. If I put a lot of these configurations one after the other, that's a history of what the Turing machine did. That's called a computation. A bunch of configurations, one of which comes from the other one, is a history of what the Turing machine did. It's a computation. Some strings get accepted by Turing machines, and they leave a long history behind them of a set of configurations which end up getting accepted. And that's called a valid computation, because it made it to the end and it accepted. And all the other sets of symbols that are either invalid because you know one configuration doesn't go to the other because it's not a legitimate move, or because you just don't accept it, all of those are called invalid computations. The reason I'm mentioning this now, because it's been brought up, is that it's a very interesting fact that the set of invalid computations of a Turing machine is a context-free language. That's a weird thing, but it's actually used in a lot of undecidability proofs. I can describe to you exactly what kind of strings result in sets of configurations which are really not legitimate, they can't get from one to another. And that set is relatively simple. Valid computations are harder to describe. They're not context-free languages. They're complements of context-free languages, which are not necessarily context-free. All right. That's a side point. Let's get back to here. Let's continue in the machine. We now move to the right, make this an X. And now, as you see, we have to pass through all the zeros, and we also have to pass through all the Ys. 
So that's what Michael was saying a moment ago. So we need y, y, r. And I think this loop is okay now. What's going to happen after a while? Let me rewrite the configuration. Let's do this. Let's say I wrote the last zero in and I change it to an X. And now I'm moving to the right, looking for ones. Then I finally find a one, right? And I turn this to a Y and I go back, right? I turn that last one to a Y. We don't go back. No, Y one left. We don't have a rule for when we're on blank. But you're not on blank. We're not on blank. We went left. Oh, we went left. We went left, and then we're going back over all the Ys, and then we hit an X. This is left. This is right. <laughs> <laughs> and, then, and then we hit an X, and what do we do? You go back right. So normally we hit a zero at this point, but now we hit a Y. That's our clue to get out of this loop. That's the while condition. If you see a Y... Leave it Y and go to the right. And what's more, keep going to the right until you eat up all the Ys. And what are you hoping to find? No Ys. No Ys. You're hoping to find no ones. no ones. Right. You're hoping to find just a blank. And if there is a blank, we're going to go to a cleanup state. That's an accepting state. There's a little bit of a difference between accepting states in Turing machines and accepting states in finite state machines. If you end up in an accepting state in a Turing machine, then the machine essentially stops. Okay, you don't go on from an accepting state. And the reason is that Turing machines need a way to stop. Otherwise, they'd keep moving off to the right on blanks. I mean, you, there's nothing to stop them. So final states stop Turing machines. If you enter a final state, you're done. If it's an accepting state, you say yes. You can also have rejecting states, final states that say stop and say no. So that's different than any of the models we've had up till now. You can have final states that say yes, final states that say no. This is a final state that says yes, I accept. The reason I'm continuing from here is because, in a second, I want to use this machine as a starting point to do this, to make a bigger machine. But for now, before I clean up, that's the end of this machine. And this accepts all the strings of the form 0 to the n, 1 to the n. Other questions so far? If n is 0, we have to go right there. If n is 0, yeah, so I don't want to fix that. So n bigger than or equal to 1, yeah. I could fix it, but... Uh, yeah, no, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter what you do when you're in a final state. There is a reason, because in this state, when I'm going to continue on and try to find 0 to the n, 1 to the n, 0 to the n, I'm going to actually clean these up. I'm going to turn them back to zeros and 1s. Right, what a mess. This is like, you know, somebody gives me input, and I draw all over it. I want to clean it up before I'm done. So I went left because I'm an anal neat freak. <laughs> All right. Questions? Was the blank symbol capital B? B, capital B. And what happens in this machine if you run out of ones before you run out of zeros? It just falls up. It just, if there's not an arrow, that, that's a, it stops. Right, right. The same as with every other model we've used. If there is an arrow here that shows up in the computation, but you know there's no arrow that, that corresponds to it, like you see a 1 in a particular state and it doesn't say what to do, then the machine crashes. Just like your, a system error has occurred. And you don't accept. Okay. Questions? All right. Here's what we're going to do. I want to fix this machine or, or improve it a little bit to do this string to do this language. This is a language that moves out <coughs> further into the nebula, out here into the design, out of context-free languages. You can't do this with just a stack. 
But it's really easy to manipulate this Turing machine to do it. Here's what we're going to do. This machine was great at getting 0 to the n, 1 to the n. Right? So what I'm going to do now is I'm just going to turn these y's back into 1's, position my head right here at the beginning of all the 1's, and do the whole machine again. I'm just going to copy the machine over, except every place that I had a 0 here, I'll put 1's, and every place I had a 1 here, I'll put 0. So it'll accept you know, 1 to the n, 0 to the n. Yeah. Why don't you do it all one time? I could. I could do that. I could I could change this to skip over here. I could have X, Ys, and Zs. Absolutely, I could do it that way. I didn't do it that way because I want to kind of give you the feeling that, that Turing machines can have subroutines. And you can use them to build up on themselves. But you could certainly do it just all at once. Okay. Questions about that? Let me, let me just show you how to clean up this thing. So here's what we do. We... Uh, if we see a Y, we turn it to a 1 and move left. And the second we see an X, I'll put a special dollar sign symbol to make sure I never go back there again, and I go to the right. So it looks like this when I'm ready to continue. X, 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 sorry, X, X, dollar sign, 1, 1, 1, 0, 0, 0, presumably. That's what it looks like. And now I would go into a state that's ready to continue and start reading these ones. And I would have a machine at this point that looks exactly like this machine, except every place I have a zero, I would put a one, and every place I have a one, I would put a zero. And it does the same thing, and there's an overlap. I showed that the first set of zeros equals the first set of ones, and the first set of ones equals the second set of zeros, so they're all the same. And that accepts zero to the n, one to the n, zero to the n. And you can finish that example. So this would not become a final state anymore. This would lose its final state status. We'd continue, and the only final state would be at the end. Copy this machine over, change zeros for ones, ones for zero. Question? You would, you would have to copy the machine over. You'd have to copy the machine over. You certainly can't just send it back there. You could send it back there, I guess, if you wanted to do a lot of work. What could you do to send it back there? Yeah, you, you, you could turn the y's to zeros and the zeros to ones and then put it back here and then send it back up to that spot. You could do that. But then you need a special way to not keep doing this. You, so it, it's just a programming decision, how you want to do it. Yeah, Michael? What's the need for the dollar sign? Oh, just, just if you got to do something else later. I, it, <laughs> the, it's often you put these special symbols in Turing machine programs to kind of indicate like, like, like a marked spot. Uh, well, let me talk about some examples of, of why, in this case, there aren't any particular reason, because we're, we're done. But, but there's a lot of other places where you might do it, and it's just kind of a good thing to do. Mark the left end so that we know that we're working with this part of the tape, and everything past here is just garbage. We don't care about it. So it's just a way of marking your garbage area. Okay, questions about this? This is a notation that is mildly different, and I don't like it as much as this. You are free to use whatever notation you want, as long as you make it clear what the Turing machine is doing. Right? And, and the book is not too different than this, but, but sometimes the book has two things and sometimes they have three things. This is very consistent. The symbol that's on the tape, the symbol you're writing, move right or left. And it's always the same. And that's why I like it. It's just easier to read. We're doing this to convince ourselves that you can program anything in the Turing machine. Is that like the motivation? Yes, and to get, a, to get a sense of the formalism of what a Turing machine is and to convince yourselves that Turing machines can really do everything. I mean, look, I really think that's a matter of, of I don't know what, it's a certain maturity to really start believing that Turing machines can do everything and maybe hours of trying to do everything with them. When I first saw Turing machines, I kind of was convinced they could do everything because everybody kept telling me they could over and over again. And, you know, I wasn't going to say they couldn't because I kind of believe they could. But if somebody had said, okay, well, you know, go write the Towers of Hanoi problem on your Turing machine, I wasn't going to be too thrilled about doing that. And neither should you be. <laughs> but, but at some point, you just get to the point where you know, well, I know I can do it. And then you don't have to. <laughs> so look, it's a hard thing in life, right? I mean, <laughs> the second you know you can do it, you don't have to. But until you've actually done it, you're going to miss some ideas later on if you can't really appreciate how powerful it, it really is. So, 
Does anyway. Make the claim in his 36 paper that this can do everything. Oh, yeah. He does. Oh, yeah. Very carefully. <laughs> yes. Um, you should read his paper, actually. It's completely readable. Uh, maybe I'll bring in a copy. It was reprinted in a lot of places. Uh, it's readable, and he does explain it. Our book explains uh, why it's similar to other variations, which I'm going to talk about right now. And maybe we can talk briefly why it's similar to your typical von Neumann RAM CPU architecture, which is what we... Oh, that would be helpful. <laughs> <laughs> no, it would be. That's, that's what your computers are. That means any normal machine language. You know, loading and storing and writing to memory. and Because it's easier for me to explain that than it is to explain why it's the same as Java. You'd believe that Java is the same as those machine language. All right, all right. You're with me. I, you, you can't make a joke in this class and get an answer, right? It's like, just let me make the joke. Leave me alone. <laughs> Was one of these things built? I mean, he wrote this paper a long time ago. Did someone first build one of these things and then build something more complex? You mean actually build a machine that... No. Not that I know of. No, I can't imagine why anybody would. Well, but, but they didn't have um, anything else. I mean, there was nothing. Um, I don't Said, yeah, so this is in, no, but actually, this is in the mid-1930s. So there were, there were kind of electromechanical, Konrad Zeus in Germany, I think, had something, or maybe Iowa? Where was he? <laughs> <laughs> you got to wonder, my, uh, my, my history of computing, is, it's, it's going to change my accent, that's for sure. <laughs> Uh, I don't really remember the, the very first electronic computer, but certainly by the 40s there were electronic computers. The, um, the ENIAC, uh, Eckert Moshley in University of Pennsylvania was in 46 maybe, 47, 48, something like that. Von Neumann himself, who kind of described the general computer architecture that we more or less use today, he built the machine in 1950 or 51 or so, uh, soon after I think he died. Um, so this is only, you know, 10 years before those actual electronic computers were built. So, we just, we so yeah, so even, even 10 years before that, there were probably electromechanical kind of prototypes that people were... I mean, Charles Babbage in, in 1880 had a mechanical computer that was much more powerful than this Turing machine. Was it general? But you couldn't be more powerful. Well, there was, <laughs> it, it, it wasn't as elementary. It wasn't a Turing machine. It, it was more... Um, it had a mill and a store. He didn't actually finish building it. It was the analytical engine. He lost funding for it. But, but, he, but he built... Uh, are we going to get it? No, no, it's worthwhile. Charles Babbage is a really interesting character. But anyway, in 1880, he, was, he had mechanical plans on paper to build something equivalent to what today is a computer. And it was much more complex in its robustness than a Turing machine. But you're right. It wasn't any more powerful than a Turing machine. But it had a memory and a CPU, and it was similar. It just was mechanical. The one that was built, the one that was built was a difference engine. And that is a special purpose computer that does finite differences, kind of like in a discrete math way. But he had plans on paper for something called an analytical engine, which was a much more general thing that actually read its input and saw a program and executed the program by storing information in the mill, which was the memory, and uh, the store, which was the memory, and the mill, which was the CPU, to do its calculations. So we did have on paper something which never got built. Uh, the thing you see in pictures, the crank thing with all the different posts, that's a difference engine. Um, the history is kind of interesting. So, so no, so nobody, nobody saw this theory and said, okay, let's build this and then work our way up to computers. That didn't happen. Maybe Bill Gates before he did Microsoft <laughs> or something. <laughs> He's thinking, oh, this idea isn't going to work. Software, that's it. <laughs> now I'm a billionaire. That's the way to go. All right. <laughs> There's a million Turing machine simulators on the web, and some of them are really good. Dimitri, you got one that's really good, right? Yeah, it's set up. You just type, uh, well, it's, just go to the web. Go to our web page, right? Okay. Okay, so you can run there, and, and, and that will help you, you know, drag your own states around and make your own machines instead of having to do it on paper. And it simulates it and it shows you the configuration and, and it, you can go forward and backward probably, right? Yep, you can run it do everything. Do everything you want. Go wild. Is there a library of functions? There's a few. Yeah. Good. 
Okay. Let's talk a little bit about this. I mentioned in advance that all the variations of Turing machines, for the most part, they don't give you anything except convenience. But I want to list some of these and talk about why, at least in principle, they can be simulated by machines that don't have these extra features. And that would, at least intuitively, prove that they don't give you any more power, that they only give you convenience. So let's work with some very easy ones. Option number one. From now on, a Turing machine is allowed, instead of having an R or an L as its third symbol on a transition, it can also have an S for stay where you are. Okay, go right, left, or stay where you are. Everyone understand? So I'm giving it that extra power. Now your programs can stay where they are. Do you think that adds power to the machine? <laughs> it doesn't add power to the machine. Why not? Because any transition you have that has an S on it, you could replace it with a transition that moves to the right, leaves the tape the way it is, and then moves right back to where it was, moving left, leaving the tape where it is. You just simulate that single transition with two transitions that go to the right and then to the left. And you can mechanically take any program that has these S's in there that means stay the same and convert them to another program that's completely equivalent that has only R's and L's. Do you believe you can do that? All right. Well, the next few things I'm going to try to explain, you're not going to believe so readily because they're harder to explain. But at least that one, I think, is, is a very clear simulation of one machine by the other. So we'll say... Stay put, an option. That's no more powerful than a regular Turing machine. Number two. Two-way infinity. Now the tape looks like this. And the head starts anywhere in the middle. And the input string goes this way. There's blanks. There's blanks on either side of the input. Maybe this gives you more power. Normal? normal is that there's an end that you start and it just ended here. And you just go one way infinity. That's normal. So actually, if you ever move off the left end of a regular Turing machine, that's a crash. That's like a division by zero. But here, you never have that problem. You can move any way you want. And look, I could have spun this lecture around because, look, you're beginners, and you're just starting to think about this stuff. And I could have made it seem like the second infinity really gave you extra power. I could have said, hey, that's like one stack, and now this is like two stacks, right? And I go really fast, and you'd say, right. Well, maybe you wouldn't. You, you're, you're all very smart, and you'd probably... But you trust me, too. So that's <laughs> tricky, right? right? You trust me, I can just make things up. So... Don't stop trusting me, but the point is, this doesn't give you any extra power. I want to know why. I want you to be skeptical. Why doesn't it give you extra power? How could you manage to simulate any Turing machine that had two-way infinity with a Turing machine that has one-way infinity? I'm going to give you a program that runs on this kind of machine. You've got to convert it to a program that runs on the other kind of machine. Now, this description of how to convert one program to another is not as obvious as the description that you use for number one. And we need kind of a bigger strategy. So, Joe, did you have a question? No, yeah. Let's discuss it. What can we try to do? Sham has an idea? Oh, I see. Okay, so here's Sham's idea. Sham says, correct me if I'm wrong, take this tape and cut it and get a really, really, really good... Uh, rope, and pull this end over, because it's infinite, <laughs> and, and crash it over here. So we're going to move it over this way, right? And then we're going to get one of these magicians who's really, really good with a riffle card shuffle, and just interleave these things. All right, so this is all done in our heads, of course, because this machine still looks like that. So that means any movement to the right on a regular machine... Sorry, any movement to the right on this two-way machine does what? Does it go to the right or the left? I, I want to hear some ideas. It's, it goes to the left. 
it's it's too much to the right if we're on the right half of the tape, and too much to the left if we're on the left half. So right moves is complicated. If you're on the right, so I guess we have to remember whether we're on the right side of the tape or not. Well, that we can do in a finite state. We'll have a state that says we're on the right side or the left side. Whoa, how are we going to know if we switch over? Well, we better put a special symbol there to know when we cross over. So the first thing we need to do is, is shift everything over to the right one. Everybody believe you can do that? Shift everything over to the right one? You can do it. And then put a special dollar sign. So I'll put a special dollar sign on that spot. And now, any time we're on the right side of the tape, which we'll remember in the finite state, if we go to the right, it means going to the right two symbols in our one tape simulation. If we go to the left, it means going to the left. Two symbols in our simulation. That's fine. So our new machine is just has extra states between extra movements, which makes it go twice over before it actually looks at a symbol. It ignores all the symbols in between. If we ever cross this dollar sign, we move into another state, which simulates our machine by, if you go to the left here, we need to go to the right in our single tape simulation by two symbols. And if we go to the right here, we need to go to the left here two symbols at a time. So this is a perfectly fine way to do it. And it's not the only way, but it's a perfectly reasonable way. And the idea is that two sets of infinity is no more than one set because you can just collapse them and interleave them as long as you explain to the person what to do, which ones to ignore. It tells you that adding more tapes doesn't It's going to tell us that in a second. Not quite obvious, but right, we're going to do that next. Good. Good. Neil said adding extra tapes doesn't help, and that's true. But that's not quite as obvious because there's more to keep track of with extra tapes than there is with just an extra half of a single tape. Let's think about this. This is not obvious. It, it, it gives you a general idea here. I did not prove this formally. But there's other ways to do it. The way that you often see this, uh, this proof done is that you increase the number of symbols in your language so that each symbol is a pair of all the old symbols. And you keep pairs of symbols in each cell. And you also keep track of, in a finite state, whether you're on the right or the left. And if you're on the right, then you just look at the first symbol in your pair. And if you're on the left, you look at the second symbol in your pair. And it's very similar to Sham's idea, but you don't need the skipping over to get to the next cell. It's right there. You just look at the first half. But it, it, it's, it's more or less the same proof. That's a very good idea. Good idea, Sean. Yeah, Joe, you have a question? Could you just say, like, put a mark on the first one and move to the middle of the infinite state and put a mark next and then simulate a two-way stack that way? And then if you get to the end, the dollar sign, you know you're at the end of the tape, just copy everything down, another infinity. What are you trying to simulate with what? I'm not sure I understand. You, just, you, you to, to simulate the two-way infinite with a one-way infinite? There's no halfway spot there. On, right. But you could do, but you could do like what a hard drive does. You could certainly move over as far as you want. Right. And then keep track of it that way, just keeping a mark. Oh, I see. And then when you get to the end, I see. It, here's, it's another good idea. Joe has a good idea. So he's saying, in order to simulate this kind of thing, just make a mark here so you never fall off the left end by mistake. Right. Shift everything over like two trillion places, and then start simulating the original machine exactly the way it is, going left and right. The only problem with that is at some point, the machine you're simulating might hit this dollar sign left, and it won't hit a blank. Then you, just then you just shift everything over and give yourself a little more room. It's perfectly fine. That's a good way to do it. It's another good way. Very good way. So then you need to write this little subroutine inside your routine that says, anytime I see the dollar sign going left, shift everything over to the right and continue. Sure. Good idea. Good idea. All right. Let's talk about some other variations. Lots of tapes. Lots of tapes, lots of heads. You can control each tape independently. Each tape has information you can write on it, and you can move right or left independently on each of the tapes. So it looks like this. Like a hydra. You 
just like a hydra. <laughs> what is a hydra? <laughs> Do they have German accents? <laughs> a Tanisoff, that's the guy in Iowa. <laughs> Howard Atanasoff. I was wondering who he was. <laughs> there was a big fight whether he was the one who first invented the electronic computer. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> Grant Wood. That's what I'm thinking. <laughs> All right, you only got one tape now, and you're trying to simulate this machine that's got a gazillion tapes. What are you going to do? Try to think high level because if you get too much into the details, it can kind of bog you up and get you stuck. Yeah. Just put multiple markers in for the number of tapes you have. So every cell is going to have. Like if you had, let's say you have three tapes. Yeah, three tapes. Put a marker at the beginning, like I said, for the two-way tape. Okay, okay, good idea. So that's yeah. good, good. So here's tape. I'll put a marker here, number one, and this will be all the stuff on tape one, and then a special marker at the end. And then I'll have all the stuff on tape two, and then a special marker at the end, and all the stuff on tape three, and a special marker at the end. There are my three tapes. I put them in a long line. This simulation, actually, is going to go a long way to explaining why a Turing machine can do a regular random access machine, because it's very similar. Think of each of these things as one cell in memory, and it's kind of what we're doing. But, but let's just stick to the tapes for a second. I put all the tapes here with special symbols around them. Now, I need to remember more than that about the tapes, right? What else do I have to remember about them? Where we are in each of the tapes, right? The head positions, the head positions in each of the tapes. And, uh, and what state I'm in, right? Well, I guess we're only going to be in a single state, right? So we can just simulate that with our own finite state machine. That's easy. But we might be in three different places on the tapes. So where do you want to store that? You can surround each of those special markers on either side with a indicator of, of where the head is on that tape yeah. we could also that's perfectly fine we could also actually like like put a special dot right before where the head is we could do that because the way you do it we'd actually have to do some calculation to move into where the head is to do some action but if we actually leave the dot right before where the head is we know where it is like if i actually kept a, an index as to where the thing is i'd have to count and move there and get there but if i just put a special dot in say right here right where the tape is, right where the head is, then my machine, whenever it sees that dot, it knows it can go ahead and process the next symbol. Keep stuff yeah, it's a lot of work. So every single step of this machine gets simulated in this machine the following way. This machine, one step, it moves things around in the tape. It moves things around on this tape. It moves things around on this tape. What does this machine have to do? Dum, da, dum, da, dum, 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 dum. Oh, here's a dot. I'll do what this machine does, and I'll make my change. Let me go all the way down to the next tape. Dum, 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 dum. Here's another dot. I'll go make that change. I'll go make that change. I'll go make all the right and left moves. I'll go all the way back to the beginning. Now I'm ready to do the next step of the original three-tape machine. So every move of this machine is a long scan and a processing of these three tapes. It's a lot of work, but we could do it. It's as though this machine has one array of memories and this machine has three arrays. And I just update each of the three arrays with every move of the old machine. And I could do this even if there were 20 tapes the same way. Now what happens if I get the dot gets up to this dollar sign and then this machine tells me I'm supposed to write a symbol? Yeah, I gotta shift everything over. Shifting things over in Turing machines is like bread and butter. You gotta write a Turing machine to do that. I mean, it's just like, you're always shifting stuff over. You always need more room. And, and you don't have any room to do anything because you're in one dimension land. So it's always moving things over and making room for yourself. Don't get involved too much with those details or think, oh, that makes something harder. It doesn't. You just have to do it a lot. You have to shift a lot. All right, so K tapes are the same. If I wrote this up formally, it would be a page long with a lot of complex technical details. And I'm pretty sure our book has a formal proof of the K-tape. Does it? Yeah. For sure, it has this. So you can look this up and, and it's not, look, it is not worthwhile ever for me to show you that formal proof in a lecture, but it is worthwhile one-on-one -on -one, and it's certainly worthwhile 
you with the book. It's worthwhile to read these things and see the difference between somebody standing in front of a class and kind of having a discussion until you believe that something's true and really, really checking that it's really true. There's nothing I said today that you should be convinced is completely true just based on my arguments. The only reason you should believe anything is because we're making some convincing dialogue and you trust me. And there's a big difference between that and proof. But at the same time, you've got to have a good sense before you prove anything. So, Next one. Non-determinism. This is a really important one. This is the one that's at the heart of the P equals NP question. Non-determinism, thank goodness, in this class, you know what it is, so I don't have to take like a two-hour time out to explain the idea. Non-determinism just means you've got transitions coming out of a state, and you don't know which one to pick. You know, the symbol says zero, write a one, go to the right. The symbol says zero, write a zero, go to the left. Which one do I do? It gives your machine some power. You have choices, and you can take any one of them, and as long as they get to final configurations, you accept. It gives your machine power, at least convenience, to have that. But does it really accept anything more than it used to? And the answer is no. So let's try to figure out how we could simulate a machine that's non-deterministic with a machine that's deterministic. And this really needs a, a careful thought. And uh, I think we'll do this example and then we'll, we'll quit for today. we got a lot more we need to do before we get into this whole theory, but this is a good stopping point. So let's talk about non-determinism, get this down, and, and quit for today. Okay, let's think before I write down a solution or describe anything to you. You've got a machine now, let's say that uh, that can make at most, let, let's say the, the state that has the most choices is, is a state that has four choices. But one of the states is going to have the most choices. There's some, some finite number. So let's say it's four. It could be anything. It could be K, but, but four is good enough. Now, I've got a machine now that only lets me have one choice on a state. How can I simulate that machine that has four choices with my machine that has one choice? This is really a tall order. Yeah, do you have an idea? Can we copy your input string four times and have and run it in series? We could, but that's not enough. We would, and then we would represent that state of four choices with one choice being in this part of the series of the computation, choice two being in this part of this computation, choice three. Yeah, so, so Chris's I you're definitely on the right track. Chris's idea is to take the input and kind of run lots of different choices through it. But let, let me back up again and, and give a big picture, because there's going to be a, a mild flow with that idea, but it's the right direction. Yeah, Joe, you have a I was continuation? Send it to a subroutine, set a flag, and then send it down four states. Put four new states in, in a subroutine. Send it to the subroutine, set a flag, and send it down to the state that the flag is. You say you, have a, you want to make it determinate, so that you have to... We want to make it deterministic, right. So you put four states in to simulate the four different paths you can take, right? Okay. And they're, they're looking for a particular flag. You send it to a subroutine that's going to determine what state you're going to be going to, what state is the right state to be heading to. You set a flag... And then you go down those four states hmm. and the flag but, but you don't know the right state you're supposed to be going to. You have to really try them all. I mean, there's no way to know. There's no subroutine that can check that for you before you actually do it. You have to really try all of them. Um, I mean, yeah, Chris, you have an idea? If, if, you could, if you could write a machine that for, for every single possible, every single combination of choices, yeah. try them all, and if any of them came up as a, you know, an accept state, you win. If you can do all that in one machine, then you're set, right? Yes. Or it's all together. Yes. And you can't do all yes. that. Yes. Yes. That's a, that's, that's a very good idea. Um, let's follow that a little further. See this little dot? That represents a configuration of my non-deterministic Turing machine. Now, remember what a configuration is? It's a, it's a picture of the tape with the state in the right place and what state it is. So that's a picture of my, my non-deterministic Turing machine. 
Now, what does a regular deterministic Turing machine look like in this picture? Here's a configuration. What's the next thing going to look like? Another configuration, another configuration, another configuration, and it goes and goes and goes, and sooner or later either it says yes or it says no or it goes forever. Computations on deterministic Turing machines look like a long line of configurations. Very boring. What does a, what does a computation look like on a non-deterministic Turing machine? It's a tree. There's lots of choices at each stage. One, two, three, four. Let's say maximum four, like, like Chris was saying. One, two, three, four. And now each of these presumably could have four. Etc. This is sometimes called a computation tree. It doesn't re represent any particular computation in the non-deterministic machine. It represents all the possible things it could do. Let's turn this non-deterministic machine simulation for a moment into a graph question, because I, I made this tree now. How would you decide whether this non-deterministic machine accepts something? At the bottom here of this tree, actually some of these things might go down forever. This, this could be infinite, this computation tree. But at the bottom, if you're ever going to accept, there might be some final states, some acceptance states. If there is a path, from the start configuration to any state that accepts, then you accept that input string. And the sequence of choices that get you from the start to that acceptance state is the path that you should take in your machine. Because that's what non-determinism means. Like Chris was saying, it's ors. If any one of these, or that, or that, or that, gets you to an end, you accept. So what we really like to do is figure out whether this non-deterministic machine tree representation has a path from the root to an accepting state. Now, how do you do something like that? We're back in algorithms now. Forget about Turing machines for a second. Somebody gives you a description of a tree that's built this way. It's called a non-deterministic machine. But you could generate the tree from that machine. You could store it in a data structure. You could build it as deep as you want. I could have given it to you as an assignment. Here's a bunch of finite states. They say what you're supposed to do on these symbols. Build me a tree of configurations. And what are you supposed to do to determine whether you accept or not? You're supposed to go ahead and find out whether there's a path from the top to a leaf that's an accepting thing. That's just a traversal of this tree. Looking from the top, looking for an accepting state. Well, yeah, the tree can be infinitely deep, so even if there is The tree can be infinitely deep, so what kind of search should we do? Some kind of a breadth first search. Certainly not a nice depth first search. <laughs> Let's do a depth first search. Dum -da -dum -da -dum -dum. Uh, one day I'll come back. As soon as I hit an end, I'll just, I'm out. I'm going to backtrack, Mom. I mean, it's like you never come back, right? You can't do a depth first search. You've got to do a breadth first search. All right, so that's fine. So I can say you have a computer. Uh, go do a breadth first search on this tree. And now you're convinced that your computer, your, your Linux workstations in the other room can simulate a non-deterministic Turing machine. Right, but that doesn't mean that a deterministic Turing machine really can. Well. If you believe me, it can, but let's thought, think about how to do this with a deterministic Turing machine. Okay? Here's what we're going to do. Let's make a little room. Your programs can, so a deterministic Turing machine can too. Let's see how it's going to do it. We're going to have one tape that's going to construct different paths through this machine, through this tree, excuse me. And the paths we're going to construct will be in order of their length, starting with paths of length one, and then paths of length two, and then paths of length three, etc. So here's what one tape is going to be. We have four choices of length one. We can either go here, 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 or here. So in order, we would generate these numbers on that tape. One, and then subsequently two, and then subsequently three, and then four. Every time we generate a number, we do a lot of work. I generate this number one. I now go ahead and simulate my non-deterministic Turing machine making choice number one. And I check to see if I'm in an accepting state. If I am, I stop and I'm done. If I'm not, go back to this tape and update it. Make it two. Go back now 
and start your simulation again from the very beginning. Where are we going to do this simulation? We need another tape. The simulation is going to be done on this tape. This tells us how to simulate. We always start from scratch, blanking out the tape again, starting the simulation from scratch. This tells us what path to take in our simulation. So when we're done with all the paths of length one, when I go one, two, three, four, what do I generate on this tape next? What tells us how many steps into it we get? Are you just doing a single? This tape tells us. There's only a single digit on this tape. That tells us which of the multiple branches to accept, right? Oh, oh, there's only two. Then there's blank after that. When there's a blank, you stop your simulation. So what's the next stage that I want to do? I want to simulate two-step computations. So, one, one. One, 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 two, one, three, one, four, two, one, two, 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 three, two, four, three, one, three, two, three, 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 four, four, one, four, two, four, three, four, four. Sixteen possible, and you can see those sixteen things here, four times four. Sixteen possible paths of length two. Try them all. If any of them succeed, you're done. If they don't succeed, back to the drawing board, update this. I want to end with figuring out how much time this takes. The book, I, I know, has a very detailed explanation of this, too, so you can look at it in, in its formal way. But let's think intuitively how much time it takes, because this is the P versus NP question. What we're doing now is simulating a non-deterministic machine by a deterministic machine. How long is this taking us? Let's say this non-deterministic machine has a path from here down to an accepting state, and this path is length n. In a Turing machine, and this gets into complexity theory, but it's an easy definition, so don't turn your head off on me yet. If it's a deterministic machine, how much time does it take to accept a string? It's the number of configurations you go to, the number of steps in the Turing machine, the number of states that you enter in that diagram. So if it takes, if your input was length n and it takes n squared steps, then it's n squared time. Just count the number of states you go to. In a non-deterministic machine, how do we measure how much time it takes? We don't count all of these and add them all up. We just count the path to the one we want. That's how non-determinism saves you time. It kind of does them all in parallel. We only count the time it takes us to do the one that works. So the time this non-determinism takes to get to this state is n. How long does it take our deterministic machine to get there? It's got to look at every single path through this tree. How many paths are there through this tree? As many leaves as there are at the bottom of the tree. How many leaves are there at the bottom of a tree that branches four times? Go take a discrete math course and ask somebody and they'll tell you it's four to the n. More or less. It's horrible. It's exponential. It's terrible. And where does the four come from? It's some constant number that comes from where? The, no the maximum number of choices you have in the non-determinism. So that's fixed. It's a constant number. But, you know, whatever it is, and in fact, you could rewrite the machine so that's always two. Right? You could just move it to, to other intermediate steps that, that split up the eight choices into, into, into sets of two choices and binary out. So you can let that down at the expense of more states in the machine, but it's never going to get less than two. So you get a simulation of four to the n. And this is what Mike Sipser was talking about and what dozens of people would love to know, is there a better way to do this simulation? Nobody thinks that there's any way to do this simulation that beats exponentiation. And everybody wants to understand, is there some way that I could convince you of that? Is there some way that I could prove to you that no matter what way I try to simulate this non-deterministic computation with a deterministic one, no matter how I try, am I just stuck getting exponentiation and nobody can prove that, at least today? And that's what the whole theory of NP-completeness is about. We can't prove it, but at least we could say that, hey, if you could, these problems you know, could be done quickly and stuff like that. But nobody can distinguish those two classes. We don't know if P and NP are different. Yeah? So there are things... Turing machines can go exponential on problems that more powerful computers won't? That... Turing machines can go exponential on problems that more powerful computers won't, right. meaning non-deterministic computers. No, no. Everything... A Turing machine can do everything that any of our computers can yes. do. Yes. But in order to do it, it might have to do, it might have to not be algorithmically efficient. Oh, actually, 
Mm, no. Um, Turing machines can simulate random access machines with a polynomial time slowdown. It doesn't take exponential work to simulate a random access memory. Right. It right. takes. So, it takes. It, take, it, it take takes some time. It slows you down. It certainly slows you down. In general, your Turing machine simulations are going to be paid for by various uh, metrics of speed, but usually they don't end up being exponential. None of these other things were exponential. Simulating K tapes was not exponential. Simulating two-way infinity was not exponential. 